Welcome to Thursday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us again today. And again, we're in week number eight of our series, The New and Living Way. And I am thrilled about what we are covering right here. This is some awesome stuff. This is reality. This is new covenant realities for all of us as believers right here. Now remember, I, we don't have to go over there. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 2. That's where we want to start again today. But remember over in Hebrews chapter 12, after he had covered the finished work of Jesus, what, it, what the finished work meant to all of us, what the blood of Jesus did for all of us, how it, it, it eliminates, eradicates, uproots all consciousness of sin, how to abolish sin, first of all, and then get, gets rid of the, the consciousness of guilt, shame, condemnation of sin in our life. He says, looking or turning away from everything else and looking into Jesus, getting a revelation of Jesus, of his finished work, of what he did for us. He said, who for the joy, set, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, the originator. He's the originator and the finisher, the perfecter, the completer of our faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher and the example of our faith because he is the author and the finisher of our salvation. Then it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What, what brought him from the place of identifying with us and becoming sin for us on the cross to the place of overcoming sin and being seated at the right hand of God without any sense of condemnation, guilt, shame, or inferiority like sin never was even in the picture for him. It's because of his finished work. This is a new covenant reality for all of us. And it's available for all. This kind of faith is available for all of us. This kind of world overcoming, hell busting, challenge eradicating faith that overcomes every challenge and everything in life, I can tell you that faith of Jesus is the same faith that we have as New Covenant believers. And so notice here in Galatians chapter 2, this is telling us the same kind of thing right here. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, as he identified with us, we are to identify with him. We were on the cross with him. That was the end of our sin. Jesus wasn't up there on the cross for himself. He was up there to bring an end to sin for us, abolish it and put it away. He said, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Notice, as we pointed out yesterday, we are twin with Christ in this new covenant, in this new creation, being born of God, being born of the same Father as Jesus does, being resurrected with Jesus, being identified with Him. Notice right here that Christ lives in us. Now notice when Jesus comes to live his life in and through you by identification, then he brings all of his stuff with it. He brings his peace. He brings his joy. He brings his victory. He brings his power, his strength. He brings all of those things with him, including his own faith. So he said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in us. And the life which we now live in the flesh... Notice Paul's talking to us now, present here on this earth, in this body, living this life on the earth. He says, the life which we now live in the flesh, I live by faith in, or again we pointed out the, in, the, in the King James is translated of, and that's at the discretion of the translators right here. It says, we can also say, we live by faith, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. So actually, the faith of Jesus is the same faith that Jesus has. Now, how can we draw that conclusion? Well, by context, if Jesus, the Christ, is living in and through us, then it's the faith of Jesus that we're now living by. Now, what kind of faith does Jesus have? Well, we can look back before even Jesus became sin and went to the cross, and we see the kind of faith that he operated and manifested. It's the kind of faith that he operated here on the earth. 
And see, he operated in a faith that was void of all consciousness of sin, condemnation, guilt, and shame. In other words, his consciousness was pure and perfected. There was no sense of separation between him and God because of sin and condemnation. See, that's why he would, he would go out and operate in a level of faith, in a purified faith, without any sense of condemnation, guilt, and shame. When he went to, this is in John chapter 11, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus. Remember that? And you can read that story. I encourage you to do so. John chapter 11, when he went up to the tomb of Lazarus, and he said, roll the stone away. Uh, he had been dead for four days. And, you know, one of the sisters said, Behold, Master, he stinketh. <laughs> it's King James. Behold, he stinks. Well, what are you going to do when you tell them to roll the stone away and that stink, that stench of death comes pouring out of there and everybody's looking at you at this point? What are you going to do? Well, Jesus knew exactly what he was do, what he was going to do. There was no hesitation there. You know what he said? He, he said right there, he said, Father, I thank you that you have already heard me. Father, I thank you that you've already heard me. He said, I'm not saying this for my benefit or your benefit. I'm, I'm saying this for the benefit of everybody around me. In other words, he was... He was using the example of how he operated and lived and walked in by faith. He said, Father, I've already, I thank you that you've already heard me. What gave him such confidence that his father has already heard his prayer and was going to answer it to the point, he said, go on and roll the stone away. What, what kind of confident faith, pure, bold faith did Jesus have to do that? Well, it could only come with a consciousness that was perfected and purified from all sin, condemnation, and guilt. Well, Jesus said, you said, well, Jesus never did sin. That's exactly right. But listen, as a new creation, born again, born of God, in the new covenant, God sees you just like you had never sinned. He sees you just like Jesus himself. Remember, we read earlier, Ephesians 1.4, Colossians 1.22 last week. How does God see us? He sees us blameless and holy and above reproach in His sight, without flaws, without failures. He doesn't see us in sin. He doesn't see us just you as a sinner. He sees you as a son born of Him, innocent, pure, like you had never sinned at all. Why? Because you have been washed in the blood of Jesus. The finished work of Jesus has already been applied to your life. And so, listen, you can have a consciousness purified and perfected just like Jesus himself. And look at all the things that Jesus did without any hesitation. He operated on a level of faith above everybody else. In fact, it just blew everybody away most of the time. While they had doubts, unbelief, even his own disciples, while they were full of fear, Jesus just, he just marched with the beat of a different drummer. He just, he would walk on the water. He would multiply the loaves and the fishes. No hesitation there. There was no separation, no sense of separation between him and his father, between him and the supply of the kingdom of God. And listen, there shouldn't be any of that for us either. We should be operating on that same kind of faith. Why? Because it's the faith of Jesus himself. It's the same kind of faith. And it's not just for us, it's for other people around us. We can begin to operate that kind of faith on behalf of other people. Now listen, you can't override somebody's will. You can't override somebody else's unbelief or doubt. But you can certainly present and project to them a confident, bold faith, just like Jesus did, that will eventually become contagious. It'll get, a, get off on all of them as well. And see, they'll recognize that you have it's not just something that came from you. It's a supernatural faith. It's not an intellectual-based faith. It's not a mental-based faith. It's not a mental agreement or mental assent. It's a faith that transcends into heaven itself. It's the faith of Jesus. It's the faith that believes God for the impossible. Now, notice, let's go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans, the first chapter. 
See, like I said, I think yesterday or the day before, we said this kind of in essence every day, that once you begin to eliminate the consciousness of sin, condemnation, guilt, and shame, once that is uprooted in your heart, once you get rid of that, eliminate it, eradicate it, uproot it, then this kind of faith is going to come in and it's going to prevail. This is the kind of faith that you're going to be living in. Purified and perfected faith. It's what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 that we read just yesterday and the day before, how it reads that we can draw near into God with a full assurance of faith. What does that mean, full assurance of faith? You have no sense or, con or, or consciousness of sin, wrongdoing, condemnation, or shame. Just like sin never existed. Just like Jesus did. You can believe God just like Jesus did. You can operate in a faith just like Jesus had and did. You can approach God just like Jesus does. You can pray and have confidence that God has heard your prayer just like Jesus did. Why? Because you have His kind of faith. There is no sin in your life that separates you away from God any longer as a New Covenant believer. Boy, I tell you, that is strong right there. I, you know, it, it, your mind's just not going to wrap around it. You're just going to have to take your faith and say, I believe this. I believe it. Your, your faith can latch a hold and grab a hold of truths and realities. Your mind is just going to tilt over. You know, you and your own heart just have to make up your mind and say, I believe this. I believe the Word of God. I believe this is a reality of my life. I'm going to mix my faith with this right here. I'm going to believe it to be true, whether my head believes it or not. I'm going to believe this to be the truth and reality of my life. Here in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now look at verse number 17. It says, For in it, in the gospel, the, the gospel is the message of Christ. It is the message of the new covenant that we are a part of, that we live in today. He says, For in it, the gospel message, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now I want you to see this right here. That the gospel message, the message of Jesus, His finished work, what He did for us in His death, burial, resurrection, ascension, what His blood has done for us, in other words, the essence, the, the message of the new covenant, notice what it does. It reveals the righteousness of God. Once you have a revelation of the righteousness of God that you have in Christ Jesus, it replaces and renovates your heart, your consciousness. It begins to eliminate, undo, uproot all of that consciousness of sin coming short of the glory of God, inferiority, condemnation, guilt, and shame. It does away with it. It's the revelation contained in that gospel message that produces the righteousness of God in your life. Well, listen, you are already, you're made the righteousness of God the moment you're born again but it needs to be revealed to you. You have to have a revelation of it. Now, as long as you're looking even partially at yourself, you're still going to have that element of condemnation, guilt, and shame in your life. But once you look away from you completely and entirely and look unto Jesus and begin to look into Him and get a revelation of Him, the message of Jesus, this gospel, then you're going to get a revelation of righteousness that transcends any kind of righteousness that you could ever produce on in and of yourself. It is a perfect righteousness, a perfect right standing with God, a perfect acceptance, a perfect favor with God. And notice, it is revealed from faith to faith. This is where Jesus becomes the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, He's the originator, but He's the developer. He's the perfecter. He is the finisher of this faith. How does He do this? by revealing Himself to you, by giving you a revelation of Himself, which is a revelation of righteousness, a revelation of who, who you are in Christ, of your standing before God right now that is free from all sin, condemnation, guilt, and shame. It says, as it is written, the just shall live 
by this faith. The Amplified says in verse 17, For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes, which God gives, which God provides, is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed through the way of faith that arouses to more faith. So in other words, your faith should be continually growing, developing, being purified, getting stronger by this constant progressive revelation of Jesus and the message of his finished work in the blood. As it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. So your faith brought you into this and your faith will carry you through life and cause you to live above the sin consciousness, above the law of sin and death that the world lives by and it will cause you to overcome and supersede that by living according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm talking as fast as I can. There's so much about this, but I'm out of time. We're going to finish up here tomorrow. If you'd like additional materials and resources, go to TonyCowan.org. We will see you tomorrow.